Hello, uh, this is the uh, intro to a fluid mechanics course that I'm teaching in the fall term and typically after going through the logistics of where we meet etc we go into the introduction of what fluid mechanics is all about. Um, all these notes are available to the students but in the video form I wanted to go over some key messages, some take-home things that will be on the proverbial exam. Uh, also something I think the the most important stuff I wanted to uh, impart. So I was going to talk about the what the basic fluid mechanics problem is. It in a nutshell it's finding velocity and pressure of a fluid particle at any point in space in the domain where we're solving the problem and at any instant in time. And the velocity is a vector. It has three components, um, u, v, and w. can be written in a Cartesian form um, as follows. So if we have three Cartesian um, axes, x, y, and z, and the uh, unit vectors i, j, and k corresponding to this uh, axis, then the projections of the velocity vector v on the coordinate axis are the velocity components u, v, and w. The interesting thing is that uh, this vector form, so we're basically we're representing the velocity as the ordered set of three scalar numbers u, v, and w. If we know that we're talking about Cartesian system, uh, then if I give you three numbers, three scalars, um, we know that uh, we're talking about a vector of a fluid particle. Um, if I give you three other numbers that represent the same velocity vector in a different Cartesian system, it's totally fine. The form of equations that we're going to be solving to find in this velocity components is exactly the same. That's the beauty of the vector notation. So if, for example, if we have um, a cylindrical coordinate system where instead of um, x, y, and z, we have r, the distance from the origin, the theta, the angle, and the z, the uh, distance from the x, y plane, um, we can describe the velocity uh, vector as a point in that space too. In fact, we don't have to work with um, even an orthogonal coordinate system at all, as long as we have three lines, three curves that are not in the same plane, uh, we could treat them as coordinate axes and describe vectors that way. Uh, pressure, on the other hand, is, uh, is a scalar. Um, it's actually, it, it's a funny thing. It's a force acting on uh, a fluid element normal to the surface of that element, so force per unit area, normal force. Um, and if we take that element of the fluid, make it infinitesimally small to a point, then kind of on the pressure acts in all directions, so the directionality becomes um, irrelevant. So we represent pressure as a scalar. So these two variables that we deal with that we need to find two unknowns pressure and velocity if if it's a reacting fluid if uh, temperature effects are important then it's also um, temperature that we're after but um, for the sake of discussion velocity and pressure are sufficient how can we go about solving the fluid mechanics problem there are only three approaches these three approaches are analytical numerical and experimental so the you have to do one of the three. Well, you can do a combination of them, but these are the three ways of solving the fluid mechanics problem. The analytical approach, sometimes we call it theoretical approach, is basically uh, forming a model of the physical phenomena. We do this by considering conservation of mass, momentum, and energy of uh, a collection of fluid particles that is confined to a volume in space, the volume that's fixed in space, this control volume. We reconcile the balance uh, between the description of the fluid particles 
that is a collection of mass and the description of fluid flowing through a fixed volume in space using Reynolds transport theorem and we turn this conservation laws, conservations of mass, momentum, energy into a system of partial differential equations, so PDEs. Then we solve that, those equations, to find velocity and pressure. Um, it's an excellent approach. If, if it's possible to solve the, a given fluid mechanics problem that way, that's the way to do it. Uh, analytical method is um, exact. An analytical solution gives you trends over ranges of independent variables. Um, it, it's great. The problem with that is that only a small fraction of real problems of interest are approachable using uh, theoretical methods because the real phenomena involves conservations of mass and momentum in, in a way that produces a non-linear system of PDEs and the analytical solution simply doesn't exist. What we can do, however, with that system of equation is very often we can find an estimate of the solution using a numerical uh, manipulation, numerical approach. And this is the where computational fluid dynamics or CFD comes into play. Uh, the principle of numerical solution in a nutshell of solving this system of partial differential equations is um, replacing the derivatives in those equations with differences. So for example, if we have, let's say, pressure as a one-dimensional function of x, we want to find the derivative of function at the given point. That would be um, a slope uh, of the tangent line to that function at the point. We can discretize the domain define points to the left and the right of the point of interest, call them x um, i minus 1, x i plus 1, and draw a straight line between them, uh, through them rather, and take the slope of that line as an estimate of the derivative of the function at x i. So the, it goes deeper than that in practice, but the general principle is this. We trade the uh, a few partial differential equations for many equations that are much simpler. Each one of them is much simpler. It's an algebraic equation, no derivatives involved. And this is what computers are good for. You can crunch numbers, solve many equations uh, fairly efficiently. And the efficiency and the um, precision accuracy varies. So that's the subject of a, of a CFD course later on. The uh, the problem with CFD, one is that they are inherently approximate, uh, and two is that um, they often require validation. So if you are um, solving a problem for a given situation, given uh, flow, and you want to apply that to a different scale, for example, you need to validate the numerical approach. So you actually need to compare your solution with the observations of the real phenomena. And this is the realm of experimental methods. Experiments are direct observations of the flow phenomena. And by observations, I mean measurements. You can measure velocity using anemometers. You can measure pressure. Um, you can use um, actually non-intrusive methods also, particle image velocimetry, you can use optical methods. The, there are some drawbacks to experimental methods. Uh, they are expensive, they don't scale generally. Uh, so there are some combinations of flow parameters that cannot scale equally. Reynolds number, fruit number, good example. Um, Typically, experiments are done under repeatable conditions in the laboratory under a small physical scale, and then the results need to be translated into real-life applications. Um, those are issues to, to grapple with. Um, however, out of the three approaches, analytical, numerical, experimental, the experimental method has one feature that the other two methods lack, and this is the ability to discover new phenomena. So the set of partial differential equations that we're dealing with in the first two approaches, this PDEs, 
This is the mathematical model. It's a model of the fluid phenomena that's based on a series of assumptions that we make about this phenomena. Without actually knowing the details, we assume certain things and make assumptions that allows us to formulate a model. So then we solve it and get numerical values, but we are bound by those assumptions no matter what. So if you are um, your numerical solution, for example, uh, produces result that contradicts your assumptions, that's, there is no doubt there was an error somewhere in the solution process. However, if your experimental result uh, contradicts your uh, assumptions, most likely it's still an error, but there is a small chance that you're actually observing a new phenomena, you're discovering something new, and maybe the whole set of assumptions needs to be adjusted. So, in addition to validation of CFD, there is this a uh, very important role of experimental methods in terms of discovering new things. And my research is primarily experimental. In our lab, we use optical methods, we use pressure measurements, direct force measurements to look at fluid structure interactions. Uh, for example, we observe self-sustained oscillations uh, of the airfoils or hydrofoils rather in, in water flows uh, for energy extraction, energy harvesting. And we can visualize the flow by either injecting the dye as in the simple experiments like this, or we can uh, apply particle image velocimetry to measure velocity in the entire volume of fluid. And once you know velocity and pressure, you, you know everything else. So in this course, uh, this is a theoretical or analytical course, so we're going to be confined to the first approach, so analytical. We will talk about how to make assumptions to come up with a mathematical model. And the, the first thing we're going to talk about next time is classification of the flows, how to um, make distinctions between laminar, turbulent, steady, unsteady flows, etc. to come up with the analytical model, a system of equations that can actually be solved in a relatively large class of problems. We'll talk about this next time.